This is a painting by Theodore Jericho known as the Raft of Medusa. It depicts a grisly scene of people desperately hanging onto a raft as mountain-sized waves roll in to throw them into the ocean. Jericho was inspired to paint this after hearing the true story of the French frigate Meduse, but despite the vivid images, it doesn't come close to how horrifying the actual events were. This is the true story of the Raft of Medusa. As always, viewer discretion is advised. Quickly, before we get into the video, I want to introduce you to today's sponsor, Factor. Factor is a meal delivery service that delivers fresh, never frozen, dietitian approved meals right to your doorstep. But what I think is the best part about Factor is that there's no prep required. The meals are ready to go in literally two minutes. You may remember when I worked with HelloFresh a few months ago, and now HelloFresh owns Factor. As much as I love HelloFresh, there are times when I'm super busy running around or with work, or more recently, busy with summertime activities where I don't have time for all the prep, cooking, and cleanup. With Factor, I can still get delicious, never-frozen meals in a fraction of the time. This even allows me to switch between brands depending on what my schedule is looking like and enjoy an even wider range of recipes. Factor alone has over 34 delicious recipes weekly to choose from. There are even meals like grain bowls and salad toppers that are ready to eat without a microwave, which is perfect for when you're out and about. So, if you're like me and you want convenient, delicious, and nutritious meals ready in just two minutes, head over to Factor75.com or click the link below and use code SCARY50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. Once again, head on over to Factor75.com or click the link below and use code SCARY50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. A couple of centuries ago, there was a strip of coast of West Africa that both the British and French were constantly fighting for control over. Between 1749 and 1816, the two empires fought to gain control over this area, which is now present-day Western Sahara, south all the way to the Gambia. And this fighting was seen as crucial to control the flow of minerals and other valuable assets from those shores. Eventually, to try to put an end to the bloodshed, in 1783 the two nations signed a treaty which was supposed to stop the fighting, but their armies mostly ignored it and continued attacking each other's positions. Over the next few decades, the battles continued and control of the region changed every few years. Finally, after Napoleon was defeated in 1815, the new French government ratified the treaty. In theory, who was allowed to do what on the West African coast was settled, and the fighting in that region stopped. In the years leading up to the treaty, much of that fighting had taken place at sea, and the legendary British Navy had for the most part established dominance. This obviously didn't stop the French from fighting back where they could, and their shipbuilders kept making ships that they hoped would be able to weaken the grip the British had on the seas. One of these ships was known as the Meduse, which was launched in 1810. Meduse was a big state-of-the-art 40-gun frigate with incredible firepower and surprising maneuverability. It was also fast, and so for the first six years of its life, it was used to lead raids on British positions on the African coast and across the Atlantic in the Caribbean. It was so quick, in fact, that whenever British ships tried to follow it, they'd struggle to keep up and then lose sight of it after a day or so. This speed and firepower also made Meduse an ideal ship to attack British convoys in the open ocean to capture British goods and take prisoners. Shortly after Napoleon lost at Waterloo, the French restored their monarchy, which meant that for the first time since the revolution, the country's nobility controlled the armed forces again. The new King Louis XVIII decided to give one of his most loyal noblemen, a man named Hugues Viscount du Roy de Chamoré, the rank of captain and put him in command of Meduse. This wasn't a popular choice because Hugues had hardly sailed in 20 years, and his appointment meant that other better officers were passed over. This was sort of seen as the king's friends taking up the position rather than more competent officers. But although the crew of Meduse didn't have much confidence in their new captain, they were well-disciplined seamen who knew they were supposed to take orders and not question them. On June 17, 1816, the new captain and Meduse set off from France en route to Senegal on the west coast of Africa. As part of the new treaty, the British were handing the port of St. Louis back to the French, and this was an important symbolic gesture that the new French royal family hoped would signal an end to the hostilities. The Meduse was the lead ship in a small convoy made up of several other ships, and because of the significance of this convoy, the Meduse had a lot of important dignitaries on board, including the new governor of Senegal and his wife and their staff. On top of that, in addition to its usual 160 crew members, it carried several hundred infantrymen who were supposed to be stationed at the port. Right from the start of the trip, and due to a serious lack of wind, the first part of the trip from France to the island of Madeira off the African coast was a bit of a struggle. Occasionally, the wind would pick up, giving the boat some speed, but most of the time, there was almost nothing. When the wind died down completely, the smaller boats in the convoy found it difficult to travel at all against the tide. Eventually, two of the ships fell behind and set off on a different course they hoped to have better conditions, leaving the Meduse and another ship known as the Echo to continue alone. 
A little while later, as the two ships continued their journey to Madeira, one of the young crew members lost his footing and fell through a porthole. He managed to grab a rope as he fell, but because Medusa was moving quickly with full sail, the cord was torn from his hands and he fell into the ocean. The crew knew that the echo was behind them, so they fired a gunshot to let them know a man was overboard and threw a life buoy out to him. Thankfully, the boy was a strong swimmer and he managed to reach it and climb in, but because he was so far out in the ocean and so small, the echo missed him and he was never seen again. This was later seen as a bad omen for what was to come. Now, the journey from Madeira to Senegal can be a dangerous one if you don't navigate it properly. The obvious and fastest route is to head straight for the African coast and follow it around. The problem is that if you sail too close to the shore in that part of the water, you risk hitting hidden sandbanks and reefs that are just under the surface. So instead, most ships take the slower route further out in the Atlantic. Unfortunately, the new governor wanted to reach St. Louis to begin work as fast as possible, and he asked the captain to plot as direct a course as he could to cut down on time. A more experienced captain might have refused, but Hugues was out to impress people on his maiden voyage. So, with the wind finally behind them, the captain ordered his men to set full sail and head straight for the African coast. For some reason that no one's ever been able to understand, and maybe it's just one of those facts that was lost to time, Ugg asked one of his passengers to help navigate the ship. As they got closer to the dangerous African coast, this passenger told the crew he'd spotted the Cape Blanco Peninsula ahead of them, which is an important landmark. Ugg then ordered his ship to turn and stay close to the African coast while avoiding one of the most dangerous reefs in the era, known as the Bank of Arguin. As they were doing this, the crew of Meduse noticed that the Echo had hung a lantern to try to attract their attention. Unfortunately, the watchman on duty didn't know what this message could be and couldn't see any danger, so he just hung a lantern out for a short time to let the Echo know he'd seen their message. Then, a little while later, they realized that the Echo had changed course and was sailing at an angle away from them. On the open ocean, you can see about 18 miles into the distance from the deck of a ship like Meduse, so when they couldn't see the Echo the following morning, they knew it had traveled at least that far away. This started to worry some of the officers, and eventually one of them, a man named Lieutenant Maudet, started to take soundings to find out how deep the water was. Every two hours, he dropped a weight over the side of the boat until it touched bottom, and each time he did, he found it a little shallower until it eventually read just 30 meters or 98 feet. As an experienced seaman, Maudet knew that if the sea was that shallow, there was a chance they might be close to the reefs. He ran to the captain to warn him, and Ugg ordered the ship to turn as quickly as possible, but in the panic, they found themselves heading straight for the coast. Then, all of a sudden, the hull slammed into something, reared up at a steep angle, and then stopped moving. The boat then slid back into the water and was forced back up again. After a third time doing this, the Meduse was stopped and wouldn't budge. The lieutenant then dropped another sound and realized that the seafloor was now only 5 meters below them. They had run aground. Incredibly, the passenger that the captain had asked to navigate hadn't seen Cape Blanco. Instead, what he was looking at was a cloud and had mistaken it for the African coastline. In fact, some of the crew even knew he'd made this mistake, but they had been ordered to take his direction, and disobeying a direct order was a hangable offense. So, they'd set sail as ordered by their captain and quietly hoped it wasn't a cloud after all. This mistake had put them 99 miles off course, heading into shallower and shallower water. If someone capable had been navigating, they might have noticed some of the other telltale signs that the water was shallow, like the white breakers in the sea, the mud under the surface, and the seaweed clinging to the ship's hull. The lieutenant had seen all of this, and that's why he began checking the depth. As was feared, they'd run aground on the bank of Arguin. Most of the crew knew what that meant, and they were terrified. The reef was notorious for sinking ships. On top of that, the distance to the coast from where they were was 31 miles and filled with sharks and other dangerous sea creatures. Ironically enough, a moment earlier, 31 miles was too close to the shore, but now stuck in the bank, it became a long way for them to be stranded. After the initial shock wore off, the crew got to work trying to figure out a way to get off the reef. A council was formed to think of ways they could do that, and the first idea was to wait until the tide reflowed the ship. If they'd gotten stuck at lower tide, they might just be carried back out to sea without issue. But, unluckily enough, they hadn't struck at low tide. They were in the middle of a high spring tide. A spring tide is a phenomenon that happens once a month when the sun, moon, and earth align, increasing gravitational forces and making the high tide higher and the low tide lower. This meant that the water was close to as high as it would get. The next option was to try to lighten the ship, so they went into the stores and threw everything non-essential overboard to lighten the load, but unfortunately it wasn't enough. Next, they thought about getting rid of the ship's cannons. Because it hadn't been a military expedition, Meduse had been stripped of all but 14 of its cannons. But either way, these were heavy, so throwing them overboard would be significant. But incredibly, the captain refused to do that. He refused to let Meduse become defenseless, no matter what peace treaties they'd signed. 
So, with 14 heavy metal cannons still on board, the ship slowly sunk into the reef, becoming even more lodged in place. When they realized that refloating wasn't an option, they started to think of a way to get to the coast. There were only six lifeboats, two of which were larger launch barges, and the rest were smaller longboats. This wasn't nearly enough for everybody all at once, but if they made several trips, it just might work. Another idea the council put forward was to accept that the Meduse was a wreck and use parts of it to build a raft that could take supplies and the excess passengers over to the coast. Ultimately, they decided to try building this raft because it meant they'd only need to make one trip. The crew then got to work removing and stripping the top masts, the yard arms, booms, and any other wood they could spare. Then they took these and lashed them together with the rope. The large masts were put on either side, while the shorter masts were fastened horizontally to tie the raft together. Two more were then placed around the center to make it stable, and a mast and a sail was set in the middle so that it had at least some way of moving on its own. The final platform they constructed measured 66 feet by 23 feet, or 20 meters by 7 meters, and was given the nickname La Machine by the crew. Today, it's known as the Raft of Medusa. The plan was to get enough food for everyone, including those in the boats on the raft and all the people who couldn't fit into the boats. The raft would then be towed behind the rest of the boats, giving everyone the best chance of survival. Unfortunately, on the third night after the wreck, a storm rolled in from the Atlantic and Medusa began to creak and groan in the strong winds and loud cracks could be heard. Everyone on the ship began to panic and worried that Medusa was about to break up under their feet. The crew quickly put the finishing touches on the raft and started throwing supplies overboard to retrieve and add to the raft afterward. But unfortunately, not everything floated, so much of what was supposed to be used to keep them alive immediately sank without a trace. As all this was going on, the infantry who were on board, who weren't fans of the navy in the first place, watched in frustration as the situation became more chaotic. In their eyes, not only had the incompetent navy run aground, but now all of their supplies and their life rafts were in jeopardy as well. Eventually, as the frustration boiled over, they started grabbing weapons and insisting on getting on the raft before anyone else. It was a tense moment, but was thankfully diffused when the rope tying the raft to Medusa snapped. It would have floated away entirely if the crewman hadn't jumped into one of the boats and headed out to drag it back. This brief panic seemed to ease tensions, at least for the moment. The following day, the officers decided it was time to head for the coast. Any slight hope that the ship might float again had been destroyed by the strong winds the previous night. The crew then prepared some food and bottles of wine to put on the boats, and then at 7am they were officially given the signal to abandon ship. The captain and the governor and all the important dignitaries and high-ranking officers got on the first barge. Everyone else then boarded the second barge and then the longboats. When the boats were full, there were a total of 120 soldiers, 29 sailors, and about a dozen passengers, including one 12-year-old child and a woman and her husband who weren't related to him. These were all the people who were left on Medusa that would now need to board the raft. And horrifyingly, after only the first 50 people, most of the makeshift raft disappeared underwater. This left people standing on the wooden platform with water up to their ankles. Thankfully, it remained stable enough to float even when full, but it would have been unnerving at the very least. Weirdly as well, not everyone even left the Medusa. Seventeen men were either abandoned or decided not to go to give up their spots for others. Finally, once everyone was loaded up, the barges began to pull away from the ship with the raft in tow. At first, the men on those boats rowed as hard as they could, but they soon realized that between their own overloaded boats and the raft essentially dragging through the water, getting to the shore might be impossible. Not all of the boats had the same amount of people either, so some were more overloaded than others. As the scene became more and more chaotic, people started jumping and climbing from boat to boat, and bear in mind that between all of the boats in the raft, there were over 300 people to manage. Officers started having to wrestle people off the barges, and soon they essentially stopped moving entirely. It's not clear why the rope was cut. It might be because the boats didn't have enough strength to pull the raft, or it could have been an accident, or as the governor later claimed, it could have simply snapped under the tension. Whatever happened, after less than two miles of being dragged towards safety, the raft was left to drift in the ocean, 30 miles from rescue. Initially, the people on the raft assumed that the barges had seen some other vessel and were racing toward it so everyone could be rescued. The only reason the ropes had been cut, they thought, was so that they could sail toward these ships as quickly as possible. But one by one, the boats disappeared from view and there was no sign of another ship coming to their aid. Their next thought was that maybe the boats would return to get them, they just had to wait a little longer. Unfortunately, as they'd soon realized, the crew had no intentions of coming back for them. Soon, they knew they'd been left there to die. Even worse, even though they tried to make a simple mast and sail, they knew there was no chance it could go anywhere. And even if it did move, there was no way they could maneuver it. As the hopelessness of the situation set in, they did a stock take and found that somehow they had only a few barrels of wine and some biscuits recovered from the sea. So not only could they not move, but they had basically no food for over a hundred people. As each of these revelations was made, some of the soldiers began to cry out in desperation. 
Thankfully, an officer took charge and laid out a plan to keep them alive for as long as possible. He suggested that they take the wine and biscuits and turn it into a paste which they could eat as a ration three times a day. He reasoned that they were in a busy shipping lane, so somebody would spot them sooner or later. They just had to keep calm and focused and not do anything stupid or panic. Unfortunately, this plan would be short-lived, and by the end of day one, all the biscuits were gone. On this first day, it was relatively quiet, and everyone sat and discussed how they might save themselves, coming up with plans to attract attention, or maybe get in the raft to move in their desired direction. When they were no longer thinking of ways to save themselves, they spent most of that first evening praying for wind to fill their little sail and wondering what happened to the rest of the crew. Unfortunately, when night came, they got more wind than they'd hoped for. A storm whipped up the sea, and with every wave, the people on board fell on top of each other. They eventually tied down a rope to hang onto to keep from falling overboard, but this didn't prevent almost everyone from getting injured as they banged into each other in the raft floor. And the storm only got worse, throwing everybody around in the pitch darkness. The soldiers, who weren't used to the sea, started to vomit as they were thrown around and into each other. By the time the storm had calmed down the next morning, around 20 people were already dead. Some had been swept out to sea, and others had been choked in the ropes that held the raft together. The next day was uneventful once again, but then, horrifyingly, the same thing happened the next night. By then, the only portion of the raft above sea level or stable was the center. By then as well, the Navy officers had claimed this spot as their own, claiming their experience meant they should be stationed there to control the sail and watch for rescue. And over the course of the day, the situation just kept deteriorating. Even by day three, the infantrymen had basically given up all hope and started to drink as much wine as they could. Tensions had already been high and only escalated between these now drunk soldiers and the Navy officers. This then turned into an open plot against the officers and some of the infantry decided that the best way to kill them was to destroy the raft entirely, even if it meant that they also went down with the raft. Finally, the situation erupted when one of the soldiers ran to the edge of the raft with a small axe and tried to cut one of the ropes that held everything together. When an officer tried to stop him, everything descended into a mass brawl. The two groups attacked one another with axes and swords, and a huge soldier started grabbing a hold of officers and throwing them off the raft into the ocean. While all of this was happening, the regular passengers just watched in horror. All they could do was spectate and hope that neither group turned their attention to them. Finally, at some point, when one of the infantrymen attacked another non-hostile officer, he was swarmed by a group of passengers. This seemed to stop the soldiers in their tracks. Even though they had greater numbers, the mutiny seemed less likely with the passengers against them too. So the fighting stopped for the time being, and the infantry moved to the back of the raft. Basically from then on, the raft was in a state of complete civil war. If the navy shouted to raise the sail, the infantry would cut the ropes so that it couldn't be hoisted and then throw the man trying to do it into the ocean. If anyone tried to do anything that could help get the raft ashore, they'd be threatened by one of the soldiers. At one point, the infantry even laid one man over a bale and threatened to blind him. He only kept his sight because the officers and passengers rushed them and pushed the bale over to free the man. This went on for essentially all of day three as the soldiers did everything in their power to destroy the raft and take the officers with them. And this pseudo-civil war only finally started to calm down as the wine was finished and everyone became weaker without food and water. Unfortunately, this also meant that the next problem they faced was deliriousness. On the third night without water, many of the survivors reported hallucinating and having terrible nightmares, and supposedly, as many as 65 people threw themselves into the sea, confused about where they were. On the morning of the fourth day, everyone woke up to find that 12 more people had died overnight. And on that fourth day, without food and especially without water, some of the survivors turned to anything they could. They ate sword belts, leather pouches, bits of leather torn from hats, and even pieces of linen but it didn't take long for them to realize that that wouldn't work. And then, aside from the last barrel of wine, there was only one food source left. In desperation, some of the survivors began eating the remains of those among them who hadn't been so lucky. By the following morning, now on the fifth day, the youngest person on the raft, 12-year-old Leon, passed away. This meant that only 27 people were left alive of the original close to 200. 15 of these survivors were hanging on, but the rest were either mentally unstable or on the verge of death due to starvation from the wounds they'd gotten during the fighting, or both. To the remaining strong, these individuals started to pose a problem. After a heated debate, the stronger survivors decided that if they let the weak die, they'd have enough wine to last another week. If they didn't, they might starve to death within a couple of days. They also thought about putting them on half rations instead, but decided that this slow starvation was crueler than the alternative. So, one by one, they took each of these people and pushed them into the water. The survivors drifted on for another few days with only small sips of wine to sustain them. By day 17 after the wreck, they'd turn the raft's sail into a small tent to fight the sun. 
It wasn't really propelling them anyway, and they were drifting south, where the stronger sun was peeling their skin and causing even greater exhaustion. So without any other way to save themselves, they just sort of waited in the tent for what was to come. That morning though, one of the sailors crawled out of their tents to see if they were close to the shore. Moments later, he ran back in crying with joy and excitement. There was a ship on the horizon and it was sailing directly toward them. Everyone climbed out of the tent and did their best to attract his attention, and as they waited, they jumped up and down in excitement and hugged each other. It didn't matter if they were navy or infantry or that they were trying to kill each other just days before. They were being saved, and that's all that mattered. They didn't even care who it was sailing towards them. Being taken as a British prisoner was better than the horror they'd endured in the last two and a half weeks. As the ship got closer, they noticed it had distinct square sails. This was a ship that they knew, and it was one of theirs. It was the Argus, which was one of the ships that was originally part of their convoy. Finally, it pulled up beside them and lowered its ladders. The ship then took the survivors to St. Louis, but unfortunately, not all of them made it there either. Five of the 15 were too malnourished, or their wounds were too infected, and they tragically passed away. Captain Hugues would go on to return to the Meduse 54 days later to try to recover the gold on board. Incredibly, three of the 17 men who were stranded there were still alive, and the Meduse was mostly intact. This also makes you wonder why he wouldn't try to return to the wreck sooner to try to save more of the individuals that were left stranded. In any case, some time later, one of the survivors published an account in the newspaper that became a scandal in Paris, and Captain Hugues was brought up on several charges. He was eventually found guilty of two of them, which were incompetent and complacent navigation and abandoning Meduse before all of its passengers had been taken off. He was then sentenced to three years in jail and only narrowly escaped the death penalty because of his noble status. Following this whole ordeal, in 1818, a law was passed that French military promotions could only be based on merit, in hopes of preventing another situation like the Meduse. Theodore Jericho's masterpiece almost captures the horror of what those men went through. The sensibilities of his age made him shy away from cannibalism, and his respect for France's armed forces also made him skip any depiction of the civil war that broke out. But either way, it's still a vivid depiction of one of the most horrible events to ever happen in the French Navy. Hello everyone, and welcome to Scary Interesting. Just a reminder that we now have a Scary Interesting podcast with new episodes released every Friday at 11am Eastern. It features brand new Scary Interesting content, similar to what you see here on YouTube, wherever you listen to podcasts. And once again, a huge shout out to Factor for sponsoring this video, and remember to check out the links in the description for 50% off your first Factor box.